I'm Dr Rudy Newman, a historian and author working with Hertfordshire's Library Service, and in this series we'll be revealing some of the important, obscure and sometimes unusual stories to be found in Hertfordshire's history. The town of Ware in eastern Hertfordshire has a lengthy history and various notable claims, from England's first turnpike road to reference in the Canterbury Tales. Numerous events have also occurred, one even leading to the modern town's name, when weirs were built across the River Lee to prevent Viking longships fleeing after their defeat in a nearby battle against Alfred the Great. But arguably best known today are two more unusual creations. In 1768, the Quaker poet John Scott inherited Amwell House from his father, deciding to renovate the garden with popular 18th century romantic features. One, which it's believed took many years to complete, would become Britain's largest shell grotto. Set into a hill, an entrance hall and six rooms were cut over 65 feet into the chalk, linked by passages and fitted with air shafts and light wells. Walls were decorated with shells, glass and fossils, and visitors flocked to see it, over 3,000 from 1779 to 1787. One, the famed Dr Samuel Johnson, described it as a fairy hall. Now a listed structure, restored in the 1990s, it remains open to visitors, although the reason for its construction, folly, writing area, or something else, remains a mystery. More famous still is Ware's other great product, which transformed from a tourist novelty to a national treasure, the Great Bed of Ware. Built around 1590 by carpenter Jonas Fosbrook, it is a deliberately oversized four-poster bed, measuring three and a quarter metres wide and nearly three and a half metres long. It is the only known example of a bed this large and purportedly is big enough for four couples. It was likely made for the White Hart Inn in Ware, situated on one of the major roads out of London and intended as much as a tourist attraction to draw visitors into the inn. Decorated with Renaissance carvings and marquetry, including acanthus leaves and many human figures. The inclusion of lions and satyrs symbolising fertility suggests it was equally intended as a honeymoon bed, the carvings all once brightly painted. Although English made, the marquetry follows popular European styles of the time, believed emulating the work of Dutch artist Hans Veedman de Vries. It was certainly used by visitors staying at the inn, a tradition growing of carving initials into its woodwork or applying wax seals and that can still be seen today. The fabric hangings, equally sumptuous, are today however reproductions based on the originals. Such was the novelty of this bed and the numbers seeing it while travelling through wear that over the generations it featured in many pieces of literature. In Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, Sir Toby Belch describes a sheet of paper as big enough for the bed of wear. Ben Jonson first described it as great in his 1609 comedy, The Silent Woman, while Charles Dickens made comparisons with its size in The Holly Tree. Having been moved to the Saracen's Head in the 19th century, in 1870 it was acquired by William Henry Teal and displayed in his public pleasure garden until the 1920s when sold. By now it was not only well known, if both praised and ridiculed, but an important example of late Elizabethan woodwork and furniture. So much so that in 1931 it was acquired by the Victoria and Albert Museum in South Kensington. So keen were they on displaying it that they paid £4,000 for it, that's over £183,000 today, making it the most expensive piece of furniture ever bought for the museum. In fact it cost four times the furniture department's annual acquisitions budget. Since then the Great Bed of Ware has been on permanent display in London, bar one year in 2012 when it returned to Ware. Artisans have been making products for local people and markets for generations, some creating substantial businesses, others dying out over time. These objects show not only how tastes and uses change, but equally help to represent and recognise the people and skills of their eras. If you would like to know more, there is plenty available, and Hertfordshire Libraries are a great place to start, with many online resources, alongside material in your local library. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and thanks for listening. Thank you.